Thank you very much, Terry, for organizing this for us. Um, what I would like to do is introduce, uh, tonight we'll be presenting to you George, uh, George Dunham, Bud Dunham, the town manager, Ed Leonard, uh, he's a PE with Wright Pierce, who is our consultant, myself, I'm the director of public health for the town of Sandwich and the project manager for the CWRMP. Uh, what we'll do is I'll give you a br uh, brief history of the project bringing us to this point, and then uh, Ed will discuss the CWRMP, the contents of it, and Bud will discuss the financing. At this point, the CWRMP has been approved by the selectmen, uh, the Cape Cod Commission, and DEP. And uh, the uh, financing was uh, uh, voted on by the selectmen and the option, and Bud will discuss that also. But just uh, what I want to do is start with just a quick story of a small town. Uh, back in the 70s, when it had a population of 4,000 people, and at the time, people at that point, they had a water quality advisory committee uh, that looked into the wastewater issues of, of the town and the downtown area and decided they needed to do something about it because of high groundwater and the types of soils they were dealing with. And uh, they had come up with a game plan on what to do with it, and the town decided, had a design for a wastewater treatment, and they went to town meeting. Uh, to look for approval of this project, and the project came with 90% reimbursement from the federal government. And it went to town meeting, and that community of 4,000 turned it down out of fear that if they built it, more people would move here. We are now a community of 20,000 people in that community that rejected the 90% reimbursement from the federal government. So it's something to keep in mind, because it was a decision made in the 70s that's now affecting our decision making in the time, in the, in the 2000s, 2000s. So something to think about. The town initiated um, about 10 years ago uh, the Massachusetts Estuaries Program. Uh, at the time, uh, on Cape Cod and down at the county, there was this fear and talk of we're going to have a Massachusetts Water Resource Authority on the Cape, and that we're going to build sewers everywhere, and it was going to and what it would cost. And um, we had uh, the town of Sandwich had yet to enter into the initial work to look at the issues, uh, nutrient issues in the town, and uh, DEP came knocking on our door. And we suggested to the selectmen at that time that we ought to start the Mass Estuaries Program, which was looking at the, the health of the estuary, specifically Scorton Creek and Old Harbor, and what impacts associated uh, with those were occurring due to, due to nitrogen and wastewater. So that was about t 10 years ago, and we had 14 volunteers over a three-year period that we s did sampling. Uh, once a week uh, throughout the summer months, at, starting at four in the morning, and we and we completed the mass estuaries program, in which we identified that our two estuary estuaries uh, did not exceed what's called the total maximum daily load of nitrogen. So that was good news, but there were still other issues because at the time, uh, being pushed forward uh, through the Conservation Law Foundation. Uh, and the EPA was what are towns doing about their wastewater, which then created the initiation to start through the Water Quality Advisory Committee in town, uh, the, the work on the uh, Comprehensive Water Resource Management Plan. Uh, just so you understand, the Comprehensive Water, uh, water Resource Management Plan was paid totally through grant funding. Uh, most towns spend millions on their, uh, their water uh, wastewater management plan. Uh, we've received fully and paid for it with, uh, with grant funding through the federal government associated with the settlement uh, of uh, contamination through Textron Corporation on the military base. Uh, during that work on the CWRMP, we had the Water Quality Advisory Committee in town, which consists of a member from the Water District, the Selectman Planning Board, Conservation, the Health Department. Uh, we had members from the SEIC sitting in, and then there were community members at large that helped uh, work on the, and make the decisions on the CWRMP. 
Uh, during that time frame of that work, we, uh, we uh, completed what then was the interim wastewater solutions report in which we looked specifically at what we needed to do with wastewater up in the, uh, I'll call it the Golden Triangle because that's what I'm familiar with, uh, because when we were looking at developing that area, uh, so we had completed the interim wastewater solutions report, which is actually part of our CWRMP. So that's just a brief history of that. And uh, to kick off the discussion, I just want to point out that on uh, the town's website, uh, we do have a page uh, for the Comprehensive Water Resource Management Plan. And one of the things we've been putting together is because, you know, in the, in the past, looking at uh, conducting meetings, you, you tend to have a, a smaller turnout, it, the same people, and we wanted to get information out there to, to the public uh, because everyone, most majority have, a, have access, whereas a lot of people, a lot of people do not come out to the meetings. So what we'll do is we'll just... Uh, kick off with the first video which kind of outlines the discussion and creates the questions and moves forward with additional videos. We'll only show you this one tonight. Uh, you'll recognize the individual in it. Uh, we had uh, Sandwich Community Television uh, created the animation for us to initiate uh, this discussion. I'm David Mason. I'm the Director of Public Health for the Town of Sandwich and I'm also the Program Coordinator for uh, water resource protection in the town of Sandwich. Approximately 10 years ago, the selectmen had asked that I initiate the Massachusetts Estuaries Program in the town of Sandwich, which was looking at our estuaries and determining if there were impacts on our estuaries from nitrogen. Nitrogen is the biggest issue in our town, which affects our public water supply, our ponds, and our estuaries. After the Mass Estuaries Program was completed, we initiated the Comprehensive Water Resource Management Plan. The development of that plan involved the Town of Sandwich Selectmen, the Conservation Commission, the Planning Board, the Sandwich Water District, and the Sandwich Board of Health, and members at large. That plan identified the issues within the Town of Sandwich and how we needed to address the protection of our water resources. And in doing so, the protection of our water resources, we were looking at protective drinking water supply for the future, how we deal with our abutters and their estuaries, how we finance that, and how we achieve economic development through this program also. So over the coming weeks, as we go forward, we will be discussing various topics with you to inform you and educate you on what this issue is and how nitrogen impacts us negatively and how we're going to fix it for the future. Hi, so as, uh, is this on? I think it is. <laughs> as he said at the beginning, my name's Ed Leonard. I'm the project manager with Ray Pierce. Uh, I've been working with the town on this project since 2011. Um, is there a, no. okay. Um, so Dave covered a couple of the, couple of the slides I already have here, so I'll be able to breeze through some of them quickly and then spend a little bit more time on the things that are related to just the recommended plan. So we're going to cover why the plan's needed in brief, the recommended plan, a little bit about costs, and then what some next steps are. So the CWRMP, as I said, started in February 2011. We finished it just last year. Uh, it's a town-wide plan, and the purpose of the plan is to identify water quality needs, to come up with potential solutions for those needs, to recommend, partic in particular, capital improvements, determine what those costs are, and then how to pay for it. And as Dave said, the Water Quality Advisory Committee was, was instrumental in this process. They, they were engaged before Wright Pier started with the project. Uh, we must have had a couple dozen meetings over the course of the seven years to help guide the plan to make it a sandwich plan and not just a plan that somebody did uh, from my office. Um, Dave covered this as well. As he said, the, the numerous wastewater planning efforts over time those were primarily focused on the downtown, the historic village, uh, town neck area. They were mostly related to sanitary concerns. 
Uh, and as we step back now, we're looking at nutrient enrichment concerns as well. Next. We've made quite a number of presentations to the Board of Selectmen, including the uh, presentation made by the Massachusetts Estuary Project on their conclusions regarding Sandwich Harbor and Scorton Creek, and that was in 2015. Um, so we've talked about the alternatives analysis, uh, the needs assessment, the alternatives analysis, costs, funding, um, what the recommended plan was going to look like, and then what the recommended plan was. So the plan itself is a water quality plan. It's not a wastewater plan. Uh, it happens to have a large wastewater component because uh, nitrogen is primarily, on Cape Cod, is nit primarily from wastewater. So we are focused on drinking water, public and private water supply protection. Uh, we're focused on ponds as well as coastal waters. So the drivers for the project are the towns own local comprehensive plan where there was uh, a number of areas identified in that plan uh, for targeted development, including the need for uh, wastewater management in those areas in order to create that development. Uh, Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection has their rules and regulations. Uh, one primary issue here is surface water protection, whether it's ponds or coastal estuaries. Um, that prompted DEP to create the Massachusetts Estuaries Project, which is a, a collaboration between DEP and UMass Dartmouth. Uh, there was a lawsuit in, in the middle there with the Conservation Law Foundation, EPA, Massachusetts DEP, and the Cape Cod Commission reached a settlement agreement, which prompted the 208 Water Quality Plan update by the Cape Cod Commission. Uh, that happened in 2013 to 2017, which really helped uh, advance the discussion, I think, pretty substantially on the Cape. So Sandwich has 19 watersheds overall. Uh, nine of them are entirely on Joint Base Cape Cod, and the other 10 are uh, radially around town. The green are the north-facing embayments of Sandwich Harbor and Scorton Creek. Those are in good shape. Uh, the yellow are the embayments of the watersheds that drain to Cape Cod Canal, and Generally, those are in decent shape uh, for the ones that, San that Sandwich has control over. There are some issues with some of the watersheds that are originate on Joint Base Cape Cod. And then there's the south-facing embayment shown in red, uh, all of which are over their threshold. And Dave mentioned a TMDL, total maximum daily load. This is a scientific uh, report based on studies and modeling, and it's a number uh, above which the, the water body can no longer assimilate the amount of pollution that's in it. So it's like putting two, you know, a, a ton of gravel in a three-quarter ton pickup. It just, it can't, it can't take the load. Um, so those watersheds are, or the TMDL is basically a regulatory criteria that eventually the regulators are going to press the towns that have TMDLs to address those pollution sources. Um, this pie chart shows uh, the sources of nitrogen. So uh, because the TMDLs are nitrogen focused, we're looking at the sources, fertilizer, storm water, uh, some comes from the atmosphere. But on Cape Cod, over two thirds of it uh, comes from wastewater. So next. So what is wastewater? Maybe everybody knows, but some, some people don't. Uh, it's basically the, the black water pipe that leaves your house or your building or your restaurant uh, in the case of a non-sewered home, it goes to a septic tank. The solids that are in it settle to the bottom of the tank. That's called septage. The clarified water that flows out of it goes to your leach field. That goes to the groundwater. Uh, if you have a sewer, it, the black water pipe goes to a sewer in the street and it goes to a treatment plant. Uh, in either case, that building or a typical household would use about 65,000 gallons of water a year. That means there's 65,000 gallons of wastewater a year, a little less. Um, and if, you have a non, if you're not on a sewer, then you, you have about 1,000 gallons of septage that gets pumped somewhere between every three to five years to keep that system working well. So basically, everybody's got a, got a role in nitrogen management. So we completed the needs assessment in 2012. The conclusions from that were that a town-wide sewer system is not needed. Um, the needs do vary based on where you are in town, and that's driven by the watershed, by the watersheds. 
Um, so in South Sandwich, the ones that were shown in red, um, the primary driver is nitrogen, but there's also issues related to pond protection and portions of South Sandwich that were identified in the Sandwich Local Comp Plan for economic development. Mid Sandwich is more where the water district's uh, wells are, so there was a, a component of water supply protection and pond protection, as well as, again, economic development. Uh, North Sandwich, uh, this side of town, we have some ponds, uh, some economic drivers, uh, and then an awful lot of expensive septic systems that basically were the, the, the subject of the 1970s wastewater studies. Uh, so different drivers in different parts of town that we kind of assembled together in, in looking at from watersheds and needs to come up with a recommended plan. We completed the alternatives analysis in 2012. Um, and again, assembled watershed-based ideas into a comprehensive town-wide approach. Uh, the Water Quality Advisory Committee had a couple of broad principles that they wanted to make sure were addressed in any alternative that we looked at. One was to make sure we met the TMDL, the TMDLs, plural, um, to leave as many Title V systems as possible, because that would result in the least cost approach, uh, disrupt the least number of properties. Um, to make sure that we addressed each of the schools, uh, sandwiches, school wastewater treatment facilities, to utilize regional approaches where we could uh, in watersheds that we share with abutting municipalities, um, to provide focused early action in the areas where the local comp plan identified targeted economic development, uh, and to be consistent with the local comp plan. So the recommended plan was completed in two th April 2017, um, and we called it a hybrid approach because it's a combination of structural measures, things that you uh, build, so uh, sewer systems, as an example, and non-structural measures, things like uh, uh, fertilizer management, uh, stormwater best management practices, maintenance practices, s street sweeping. Um, so it's a hybrid approach. It's not just one thing. Uh, we proposed a phased implementation plan, so it's three phases over 60 years. Um, we have a decentralized wastewater approach. There are three small treatment plants that are proposed as a part of the project. Um, one is near the, uh, in, at the end of the industrial park. One is in the area of the marina. And then the third is the existing Joint Base Cape Cod treatment facility to connect to that for a portion of flow in town. Uh, the plan includes some water main extensions to a couple of neighborhoods in East Sandwich that have uh, fairly good sized areas of private wells that have high nitrate in the, in the private well, uh, resulting from wastewater but it becomes a drinking water issue. So that was a uh, recommendation was to extend water mains to portions of town. Um, to work on some of the management approaches, as I said, fertilizer and stormwater management. Uh, the town's already part, ha has a permit from EPA for its stormwater already. So stormwater management is really something the town is already doing through public works and engineering. So this is just a capturing that benefit. Um, we recommended beginning some efforts on freshwater pond management. The town has some good regulations that were put in place a couple, uh, five, ten years ago now for pond protections in the um, three pond area. Um, where we're looking to expand on that, and there's a, a study that's ongoing right now to get specific data from all the large ponds in town to come up with specific uh, implementation plans for the ponds to protect and maintain the quality of those ponds. Uh, we're going to use what's called an adaptive management approach. So when you have a long schedule, um, that's, that phrase came from the Cape Cod Commission's 208 plan. It's, it basically means you're going to do a project, you're going to monitor the effectiveness of that project, and then refine your plan as necessary to maximize the effectiveness of it. So in this case, we're going to do phase one, monitor how that goes over the 20 years while that bond gets paid off, retired before we begin phase two. 
uh, and that's a, that adaptive management framework is, is uh, condoned and approved by the commission, Cape Cod Commission and DEP. Um, Sandwich has been working with Mashpee and Barnstable so far in the Papanesset Bay watershed. There's an intermunicipal agreement uh, to, to recognize that each town has a responsibility to clean up their pro rata portion of the nitrogen that goes to those south facing embayments. And so we're going to continue, uh, the town's going to continue to work towards that end of regional collab collaboration to, to maximize the value of any investments that are made. Uh, and we would do that in part through a nitrogen credit trading approach where Sandwich might pay some money to Mashpee to make it, to do a project that's really close to the water. And the benefit of that is you can quickly see the improvement or the, the environmental benefit of that improvement that really helps refine the adaptive management approach. If we did a project in Sandwich and it took 50 years for that groundwater to flow all the way to, this, to three bays, we can't quite get the, um, the, you can't get the speed to facilitate that adaptive management approach. So that's really what the regional collaboration and nitrogen credit trading is about. And as Dave said, we did get uh, approval recently, just uh, last month from the Cape Cod Commission that this plan is consistent with what they're expecting through the 208 process. So we broke the project cost down into the three major components, wastewater, water and storm water, uh, and then the management approaches. Uh, and the total of that is $86 million for phase one. Excuse me, so that's the phase one cost. Bud's gonna talk about the financing elements of that. So well, the implications of no action. Um, this is really a, I guess, this is what we've seen in other places. It, it, in Cape Cod, this, the regulatory framework has taken an awful long time to, to sort of come to a head. Uh, as Dave said, this goes back to well before 2000. Um, you could say for sure that you, could, you would see continued deterioration of water quality. You know, the rate, of which, rate at which it would deteriorate would depend on the water body itself, but it would continue to decline. Um, there would continue to be the limitations on economic development that the town has been struggling with for, for desiring to change for some time. Um, there could be some potential longer term issues with drinking water protection. There are a number of, uh, the Sandwich Industrial Park being one, you know, part of the towns in, in the water supply protection zone. So you, uh, that's a longer term item. DEP and the commission have some enforcement uh, ability, and they haven't exercised it to this point. In other communities in Massachusetts, if they don't like what's happening, they've implemented moratorium, sewer moratorium, growth moratorium, uh, things like that. That could happen. Haven't, haven't seen it happen on the Cape. Don't know when it might happen, or if it would at all. Um, we, don't, we do, as I mentioned at the beginning, there was a lawsuit by CLF. There was a settlement agreement with the commission, DEP, um, an EPA and conservation law uh, that basically said that the towns collectively, not sandwich, but all the towns need to make progress. Uh, and I think generally they've been pleased with the collective progress. Um, the so Conservation Law Foundation did recently file a lawsuit against two large uh, hotels on the Cape, so I think that was, you know, just a signal that they haven't gone away, that they haven't forgotten about the Cape. So it's, it's a potential. You know, it, again, I, the, these things don't turn into large federal projects where, where the agency will come in and do all the work and send you a bill. What they do is they just turn up the pressure. They say, well, that town meeting failed. Okay, when's the next one? If that fails, when's the next one? You gotta keep, so um, that's what could happen with a failed town meeting action. They just will turn up the pressure. So these next two slides we presented to the, to the select board um, in June, I believe. There are quite a number of things that need to happen between now and breaking ground on anything. Uh, there's a number of uh, big picture decisions that need to be made, in particular the timing, how much project, how much of the phase one project do you bite off in one in the, in the first 
go at it. Um, we know that there are some constraints on the, treat the existing school treatment facilities. They aren't going to continue to run forever, so there's a couple of there's some give and takes on the list here. Um, the most important one is to secure a dedicated funding me mechanism, which again, uh, Bud's going to talk about. But it's, there's, there's lots of steps to getting to a, to a completed project, and, uh, and they all take time. So again, there's you know, more stuff here. Uh, two important things to highlight here, as I mentioned earlier, we did initiate a pond water quality study uh, earlier this year. A lot of data was collected. You may have seen uh, the team out there on uh, some of the ponds. Um, and we're getting that data in now, and are going to start looking at that, and we'll be back to the town on the findings of that uh, this winter. Um, we received the 208 consistency determination. So um, again, lots of activities, and um, that's all I have. I guess the, the next slide is just the the plug that water's worth it. Uh, thank you, Ed. Uh, my name is uh, Bud Dunham. I'm the town manager, and um, I get the joy of trying to explain, like, how do we pay for this, um, which I know everyone is concerned about because um, everyone feels that they pay too much in taxes to begin with. So. Um, the staff, uh, meaning myself, a number of our financial team, um, working with Dave and Ed, talked quite a bit about, you know, how do you come up with that $86 million for phase one, which I don't think Ed touched on, which we see as like a 25 to 30 year window. So that's a lot of money to come up with in a, a relatively short period of time. But surprisingly, when you look at other towns on the Cape, they're looking at $250 million, $400 million. So in a strange way, we're actually lucky that a lot of our water flows to the north, as Ed had pointed out, and Dave as well, that the uh, north-facing embayments are not in trouble. We're still polluting those areas, but they're not in trouble like the south-facing embayments are that we contribute to uh, in Barnstable, Mashpee, and Falmouth. So after much discussion, many presentations, the uh, selectmen unanimously voted a few months ago to support the concept of the key way to fund the financing of the CWRMP is through a water infrastructure investment fund, um, or a WIF. And so the, it's a unique concept, similar to the Community Preservation Act. And I say unique because I think it's been in existence and the ability in Massachusetts to take advantage of this for about four and a half years. But to my knowledge, no town has voted to do it yet. Um, so I think we would be either the first or one of the first. Um, and what it does is it allows a surcharge of up to 3%, similar to the Community Preservation Act, and the funds can only be spent on the three areas that Dave and Ed highlighted, water, wastewater, and stormwater. So it's exactly what we need the $86 million for. Um, the voter approval process that we have to go through is the exact same for adopting the Community Preservation Act, and it's a, a two different hurdles to adopt it and then a third hurdle to spend any money from it. So it requires town meeting approval in a town of our size and our um, legislative makeup. And right now the selectmen have voted to hold a special town meeting on November 5th. I'll be upfront, we have had some issues where the next day is the state in, uh, election. And so we're trying, that date may change, we're not sure, but um, at least right now it's scheduled for November 5th. And then there has to be a required gap of a certain amount of time that's specified by state law if it's either a local election that's taking place or a state election. And so if it gets supported in November, we also need for the second hurdle a townwide ballot question that would appear on the annual town election next May 9th. And then once money comes in, just like the Community Preservation Act, it requires a town meeting vote to expend any of those funds. So also point out, because this has come up at recent finance committee meetings, the money that I believe we can generate from the 2%, which I'll get to in a second, doesn't equal the full 86 million. And so we uh, recognize that there's additional funding that will be needed, but we feel that there's other sources that exist out there. And I'll just touch on a couple of those. Um, the state has excellent programs for certain types of wastewater initiatives and water initiatives where there's either a 0% interest loans that you can get through the state um, for certain types of projects, 2% loans for other types of projects, and then if we had to bond on our own, we usually look at a bond rate 
loan that we're looking out down the road of probably about 4%. So in all the estimates we did, we used the average of 2%, which is a lot better than any of us could borrow or bond if we had to. Um, there's also state and federal grants that are available, but those really can't be applied for until we have um, harder plans, true construction documents, um, shovel-ready projects ready to go. But there are grants out there for that that we think we could be successful with um, on individual projects to help offset some of those costs. And then also on end users, especially in terms of operational costs, and we'll touch a little bit on what those could be, but when someone hooked up to a sewer, the flows that they generate uh, relate to a per gallon cost that would come, and anyone who was hooked up would have to play a per gallon rate. Instead of having to replace a septic system in the future, you'd have those annual costs based on how much you actually used. And then lastly, I wanted to touch on, because I know this has been a, a big initiative of the Cape Cod Chamber of Commerce, um, there's been talk about an additional 2.75% additional rooms tax that would only be on short-term rental properties, i.e. Airbnb type operations. So my understanding based on a state meeting I was at last week is the legislature and governor all support the 2.75% for Cape Cod short-term rentals, but there were other problems that they had with each other's versions of the law, and so that never got passed when the legislative session closed this summer. So although there was a lot of talk that something was gonna be resolved, it still hasn't been resolved. So I wanted to know myself, like what did that equate to for the town? So I reached out to the Cape Cod Chamber and they actually hired some of the consultants who work with Airbnb and tried to use existing data from all 15 towns. And to make a long story short, the very, very rough estimate that they had for a town like Sandwich would probably generate about 500 to 550,000 per year of that 2.75%. The way the law's been written so far, and again, I'm sorry, the act has been written, but it's not law yet, is that money would go to a county water protection fund. Towns would then apply to that county group to have the funds released to their town. My understanding is the goal is to get any penny you generate from your town to come back to you so you can do wastewater and other water projects. But that's still up in the air, but everything we've been told is that's coming, it just hasn't been worked out at the state level. And then we're also trying to uh, look at other ways to potentially mitigate taxpayer costs. And that's an issue that's come up at the last couple of finance committee meetings and the selectman meeting. Um, so as town staff, we're gonna be working on trying to see if there's any other ways we can try to hold down the impact of this um, on the homeowner and taxpayer. So just to talk quickly about why the Water Infrastructure Investment Fund, um, again, you can go up to 2%. Based on our analysis and our opinion, I'm sorry, you go up to 3%. If you go up to 3%, in our opinion, you bring in too much money. I don't think the voters would support it. And so in looking at those numbers, what we came up with was 2%. Um, that would generate enough money so we could do certain projects early on that we need to do to sh start showing the state, the feds, and the CLF that we mean business and we're, we're gonna be repairing some of these things and trying to address our own problems. Um, the 2%, if you look at it, it probably isn't enough over time to fully cover that 86 million that we identified, but the vast majority would be, and then with those other things that I mentioned, we feel that could supplement um, some of those other needs that we're gonna have without, um, so basically coming up with other funding sources. What's nice about it is it provides a sustainable, reliable funding source. We can calculate very closely what we're gonna bring in each year for that and what we can use uh, those funds for. It does require public approval, like I said before, once it's adopted in those two uh, methods that I said, a town meeting, a town-wide ballot question, it does require a town meeting vote to spend a penny of any of those funds. But the beauty of it is it avoids like death by a thousand cuts where we'd have to go back to voters every time we tried to do a decent sized project and have to ask for repeated ballot questions, we wouldn't. We'd have a funding source that we can actually have authority to bond against. And that's really important. Um, the other nice thing is once the fund's there, it's relatively uh, flexible. It gives us speed to act when certain things happen, and it gives us the legal authority to address problems. And as Ed had pointed out, those problems just aren't just our own. We have sandwich specific water quality issues in certain parts of our town, but I think when you saw Ed's map of the three phases and the three potential wastewater plants in um, basically on the base, in the uh, industrial park area and in the marina area, there's a whole chunk of town that isn't even uh, gonna have to be sewered. 
and I think in Ed's report goes into a lot of detail, only roughly 20 to 25 percent of the homes in Sandwich would ever have to be connected to a sewer system. And that's important to know because a lot of people talk about the MWRA solution, big pipe. Obviously, 20 or 25 percent of the homes is a lot less than what is looked at elsewhere. Um, and then we have to understand that there's certain federal, state, and court ma mandated solutions that we're going to have to address. We have our wall water quality issues shared with Mashpee, Barnstable, and Falmouth. Um, we signed, I think it was the second ever intermunicipal agreement on the Cape for Pompanesset Bay. We've had meetings with both the Three Bays and the Wakoit Bay um, groups. So we really think within a year from now we'll have three signed legal agreements with, uh, depending on which bay it is, uh, with our neighbors from the three south-facing communities um, that will be the first town on the Cape probably that has addressed all of its problem in Baymonts with a legal agreement. So that's something we're working hard on. And then also there's going to be water quality issues that may arise in the future. You hear um, many groups, including the Cape Cod Commission, the Water District, talk about uh, contaminants of emerging concern. They may be contaminants that we've been putting in our water for decades that we're not going to know about or that cause problems down the road. And this at least gives us a source of funding down the future so we can address those problems. And I think most importantly on the two things that we're identifying, it responsibly pays it forward to the officials and the, our residents, whoever's sitting in our respective seats 25 years from now, did what we funded actually work. If it didn't work, we're going to have to do even more at phase two than we think now. If it worked better than we thought, maybe we have less to do at phase two. But the beauty of the 2% WIF is that it provides a constant funding source that in the future the uh, officials and residents can count on. Um, the selectmen talked about to mitigate the expense of that new 2% surcharge to propose to the voters to decrease the Community Preservation Act surcharge from 3% down to 2%. So what that goal is, is to try to alleviate the financial impact and, and burden that we placed on taxpayers by asking them to adopt the 2% WIF. It provides sufficient funding at 2% to meet all of our previously approved debt obligations. We looked if we went a little bit lower and it looked like for at least five years we wouldn't be bringing in enough to fund the CPA debt, which we're required to do by law. So the selectmen didn't support going um, less than 2%. It also provides funding for our current and future CPA projects. Um, I don't know if this will surprise people or not, but when we looked out of the um, implementation of what was first the Cape Cod Land Bank that eventually became the Community Preservation Act, we've actually funded $30 million, $31 million worth of projects from those funds, ranging from you know, some $7,000 things to preserve some old documents in the archives um, to fixing up this building um, that we're in right now. Um, and again, we feel like by keeping that 2% CPA, it, play, it responsibly pays it forward to future officials and residents for other needs and things that will arise uh, down the road. So what's the cost to taxpayers? Uh, with the 2% WIF and the 2% CPA, it would equal a total surcharge of 4%. So right now, people are getting 3% uh, from just the CPA. So the net impact is that additional 1% surcharge on tax bills that would pay for both the CPA and the WIF. And if you do the math and look at it, the values and, and the expenses, that additional 1% impact for the average valued home, which is just under $400,000, our average valued home is at $392,000, it equates to $58 in the first year. That increases by 2.5% a year, but the annual increase over the first 25 years of the plan is less than $3, $3 per year and the average payment over that 25-year period is $86. I have to say, even though this is what I do for a living, I was shocked that we could address basically an $85-plus million dollar problem for relatively, and I know it's all you know, in perspective, that's a lot less money than I thought. And if you looked at any of the other things that we're going to have to do, and if you funded them through separate debt exclusions, I can assure you it would cost us way more than 86 bucks a year for the next 25 years to implement those different components. And so uh, we really feel this is the best way to go. Um, what our fear is, and it's completely up to the voters, if they say no, you know, what's the cost of no action or insufficient action? We believe the groups that Ed and Dave highlighted, the state and federal regulatory agencies and legally through that CLF lawsuit and the settlement with the Cape Cod Commission in Barnstable County, 
we, things would be forced on us that would cost a lot more and we'd have no local control. So I think that's our big fear. If we take a couple bites at the apple to try to get this passed and it's not successful, what are we gonna do um, after that? And I think that's a little bit daunting and uh, scary for um, you know, those of us who work in town and those of us who live in town. Um, and then one of the other questions that I know has been raised, my understanding is at a recent community preservation committee meeting, they don't support dropping from 3% to 2% for the CPA surcharge. So I just wanted to show people, hypothetically, if that happened, say the voters said yes to the 2% whiff, but they rejected redu reducing the CPA from 3% down to 2%. Basically, the impact on the average home, because it was only gonna be a net 1%, is now a net 2%, so it would double. So it would be $116 the first year, and then averaged over the first 25 years would be $172. Um, and so one of the uh, slides that Ed presented with the selectmen um, that I just wanted to show you quickly because this is one that Ed presented multiple times in the last uh, eight months at a list of many of those meetings um, that he, he highlighted. So this came from them and this was um, back when our plan was finalized earlier, actually late in 2017. The estimate on sewer user rates per year is about $1,320 for a single family home and then the tax impacts, if we had funded that full 86 million bucks in one fell swoop as a huge debt exclusion, which legally we couldn't do, but hypothetically if we did, the cost of that is about $267 per year. So it shows you here on the costs that are averaged on an annual basis over a 25 year period. If any of us, who or all of us are on septic systems, but if we have to replace our septic system, it typically costs about Twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars to fully replace. So the cost for doing that each year is a thousand dollars, and then you figure if we're pumping out our septic systems every two to five years, that costs you probably three hundred bucks those years as well. So we felt a fair estimate to use is about a thousand dollars per year if you average it over that twenty-five year period. Whereas if someone had to hook up with a sewer system, and I stress this is only twenty to twenty-five percent of the homes in town, not every home has to do it. The cost to actually do the hookup and to look at those um, costs each year about the, vi the gallonage that each average home would generate, it equals the $1,320 that's identified above. And then if you added the tax impact for the capital things that we need to do that we plan to charge all the public for, it would be $267 here. So the total um, is just under $1,600 if you're a sewer user and about $1,250 if you're a septic user. So the difference is about $320. So if we go to the, and this is what we were thinking late last fall. So if you go to the next page, which um, shows um, what if we implement the 2% width and that net cost of one. So all these numbers are the same. The big difference here is that the 1% width is now only $86 instead of the $267. So in a sense, it saves each, each end user 180 bucks per year by doing it that way as opposed to doing it all through debt. Um, I know those are really rough round numbers, but we just tried to give you a feel on what those costs would be. Um, I've talked to a lot of other communities and you know, Harwich is looking at you know, 250 million bucks instead of 85 million. They have two lawsuits for two of their biggest taxpayers right now from the Conservation Law Foundation about not doing enough. Um, Yarmouth has tried to do certain things in small pockets of town, some of which have been turned down. Falmouth has been successful. They have existing sewerage. They got a lot of money for it. They're treating their wastewater, but their embayments are in such bad shape, they can't even dispose of the treated effluent that we could drink out of. They're not allowed to dispose of it in, in that recharge area. So that's why Falmouth is trying to work with us with the Upper Cape Towns all as a whole. How can we work together to hold down costs wisely as a group as opposed to doing stuff on our own? And that's also what we're trying to do with our neighbors from Mashpee and Barnstable and Falmouth as well. So I, at this point, I'll turn it back over to Dave and then we'll take questions. What I'd like to do before we take questions is just direct you again um, after we're hit done here tonight, when you have some time, go to the town's webpage. Uh, there's a couple videos up there now with explanations and information regarding this issue. There's others being produced at this time that we'll be putting up on different subject areas associated with this. Are there any questions? As you know, 
most, my name is David Darling and I live in East Sandwich. As you know, most of the land in Sandwich is not on the tax rolls. Uh, I have one idea to improve that situation, and that is to go back to the legislature and ask them, in this circumstance, to not allow any property to stay, on the ta stay off the tax rolls. Do you have any reaction to that idea? Say that if you're uh, mostly referring to the state land, um, roughly a third of Sandwich's land area is located on Joint Base Cape Cod. So I think we're 45 square miles and 14 square miles of the 45 is out on the base. The state does pay it, make a payment in lieu of taxes each year of about $800,000. So they, it's not what they would pay if they were fully you know, taxed, but they do give us a payment in lieu of. Steve Barr, Forestdale. First off, I'd like to address the science behind this. The modeling science on nitrogen load in ponds is complete junk. Everybody that knows anything about the science knows it's complete junk. The DEP doesn't even believe it. The science, the, the reason why the ponds have a lot of nitrogen is multi, there's a lot of reasons for it, like plants are built with nitrogen, and the biggest reason for the nitrogen load happens to be uh, Home Depot, Abishon, Ace, and all the fertilizers that people insist on putting on their lawns, and their gardens, and their flowers, et cetera, et cetera. The, the science is bad. The solution, to nitrogen load, since you start with a bad premise, the solution to do a septic system, that doesn't follow. And two, every year it seems that this town holds a special town meeting to squeeze more money out of us. Mr. Dunham, aren't we about to start paying for the building that's happening on the corner of Katuit and Quaker Meeting House, doesn't that bond start getting paid this year? Every year, it's just a little bit, just a few more dollars in your tax bill, just a little bit more bonding. Yeah, I'm bonded to death. We got a $30 million bond, hopefully it will end at 30 million, that we haven't even started paying for. We have older bonds. We're in debt up to our, our eyeballs, and you're talking about taking on another $86 million, maybe. Oh, but it'll only be 2% or 3%. It's ridiculous. And anyone who looks, I own property in the uh, MWRA. Those numbers a junk. You want to see a water bill that includes sewerage on a two-family house that comes to over $400 a year, ask anyone that owns a house in Boston. Those bills are absolutely outrageous. I'm a trustee of a, ma of a fairly good-sized complex. Our largest bill is not insurance, it's not heat. It's the water and sewer. That's our largest bill. That was pittance before, before MWRA came into existence. I, I just hope people wise up and vote this thing down. I'd just like to respond that um, if you've listened to any of the presentations that Ed and Dave have made over the last eight years with the selectmen, we're purposely trying to avoid the MWRA um, type of funding, and the cost of what we've presented is far, far less than any MWRA town that, and what they've done. And then just to correct you, you'd said there was a $30 million worth of unissued bond. That's not correct. There's 17 million on the public safety building, and um, the recent thing that we did on the roads, which I believe was seven. So I don't know where you're getting the 30 million from, but 
I just wanted to correct and be accurate. That's a different conversation for a different night, but thank you. Do we have any other questions? David Darling again. Just to uh, give you all an information piece, Ed Child sent me information about how much of the total of the land mass of Sandwich is on the tax rolls, 34.26%. You want to argue with that? Bud? Not on the tax rolls. 30 Taxable, 34.26% of the land mass and all the property in Sandwich. So we're not taxing a huge amount. And we know why there's a, a large piece of land that the federal government and the state government and so forth has that is not occupied um, by homeowners, et cetera. So that puts the burden on us, the property owners, particularly residential property owners. Now my suggestion for how to pull this off and I've shared this with both of you, and I've got no reaction, is that we float a revenue bond to pay for phase one. Is there anything wrong with that? And I do not want to pay for it. I live in East Sandwich. My sewage is not a problem. You just went over that. And I don't want to pay for this. What you're referring to is a revenue bond. I don't believe that's allowed under state law. I don't, I don't know. I've never heard of that phrase in any other town in Massachusetts. And I think the problem is, is like Dave and Ed mentioned, every homeowner in town is polluting our water. It's just that those whose water flows to the north is not having a pound in embayment yet with nitrogen, but those that flow to the south do. And what the problem is for people whose water flows to the north, because several of them are on private wells, if your septic system starts polluting your private well and you're no longer able to get potable water, what, you know, we all bear responsibility for addressing that problem, because we're all creating the pollution problem. And the other part I'd mention is that we didn't really touch on too much tonight. It was in a small bullet, but I want to highlight it. All three of our public schools are will be under orders from DEP to upgrade to tertiary treatment. The estimated cost for each school is about $10 million each. Now, someone from the Finance Committee rightfully pointed out when certain school improvements take place, there's the Mass School Building Authority that might be able to hold down some of those costs. Um, the last time we did it, I think we had the Oak Ridge and Forestdale school roofs and windows. We, we uh, got help on 40% of the cost, but, you know, even 60% of $30 million is a huge amount of money that would be so much cheaper to connect to a proper sewer system. It really is the only way to go. And the state's only going to be so patient in terms of waiting for us to address those. When that happens, like we will literally have to do something or something will be forced on us. And I just think the proposed financing plan that we've outlined makes way more sense than um, doing separate bonds every time we need to do small projects. It'll cost us more. Can we actually draw a benefit district and keep East Sandwich out? Including as well. Not according to any indicators you have. I don't think that's accurate. Again, I'm Terry with the Sandwich Chamber of Commerce. One thing I can tell you as a chamber executive that this is not a problem that's going to go away. Everybody on Cape Cod is facing this. And we're going to have, Sandwich is going to have to deal with this whether they like it or not. And this is starting to, t we're just talking about how we make it happen, how we pay for it. But don't fool yourselves into thinking that something's not going to happen. It is. It's going to come one way or another. And as Bud has mentioned, we can plan together as a community how that's going to happen, or eventually it, we will be told what's going to happen. And so I want to thank all of you for coming out to be part of the conversation, for educating yourself. Um, one last call. Is there any other last questions? Yes, sir. Thanks. I'm old and I'm confused. I saw a price tag of $86 million on phase one. Is that correct? Now, if this WIF is passed, will that completely fund phase one? 
It won't. Um, based on what the 2% projections show, um, we would have enough to pay for the debt for the $30 million wastewater plan at the end of Jan Sebastian Drive. And over a 35-year period, there'd be another $46 million that we'd have. So if you add up the total amount that we expect to bring in during that 35-year period, it's about $75 million. So that's why I suggested that those other things that we identified, um, both um, that 2.75% if it happens on short-term rentals, the um, state and federal grants, some end user costs, mostly for those to pay for operational costs, and um, I forget what the other one was, but those are the types of things that we think can make up that gap. Okay, so uh, I think if I understand this, the the two percent increase you're talking about now would fund just a portion of even phase one. I guess but knowing the years and the amount that it would generate, it would fund, in my opinion, the vast majority, like 85 percent. We'd be a little bit short. At what point would we learn that there's more funding needed? I think the question would be, at one point, would we know that the treatments that we've implemented and the plans that we've implemented, have they been successful? And I, I don't know, it would probably be better to answer that. Yeah, well, I guess in, in terms of the facilities that would be built, those would, would be monitored according to the permits that are obtained for that process, so you would, for that facility. So you would know how that facility is performing. In terms of the environmental monitoring, um, as I mentioned, there's travel time between, uh, you know, where a property is located and, you know, it takes from, from the heights, the high, height of land in Sandwich to the north-facing embayments or the south-facing embayments is 40, 50 years. So there's a long period of time where that, that cleaner groundwater would take to clear out. Um, so, in terms of phase two, you'd, you'd be looking for the signals uh, along the way. You know, looking at pond water quality, looking at estuaries. It's it's a long it's a long time. Sounds like frame. it's a long ways away. It's a long it's a long ways away. But but, but, but the the funding mechanism that you're talking about right now does not fully fund phase one. And at some point, which is indetermined, not determined we will learn what the shortfall is, and then we'll have to increase the taxes further. I guess, but maybe you can talk through the cash flow piece of it. Cause it's <laughs> yeah, I think, I think the big difference, though, is like if, like, is what's been talked about is gonna happen if the 2.75% on short-term rentals go in, just for like a, an idea on quantities. So with that 2%, the first year we'd bring in just south of $1.2 million. So if the Cape Cod Chamber's estimates are accurate, and if anything, they thought they were underestimating them for sandwich, so just say it's 500,000. You know, that's another 25% of what we bring in the first year. If that happens, I think that would close that gap that you've talked about quite a bit, and it would, if you, ran, if you added all that in and increased that by a little bit each year, it should come very close to the 85 million. As best okay. we can tell, but and understanding these are like, you know, 30,000 foot numbers based on estimates we have for projects today. We don't know when actual bids happen. Will it be more or less? We don't know. It's, this is an expensive project, yeah. and, and we all know that it's needed. But the numbers that you are putting up there, you know, $58 a year, makes it sound like this proposal is going to m mitigate the impacts on everybody dramatically. And yet, in answer to the questions here, it, so it sounds like that's only a partial. And we really don't know what's coming after this. Is that fair? I guess I would characterize it, but if, if we bonded that $85 million today, the cost would be 270 bucks per person. The way we're coming up with brings us almost the same amount of money at you know, less than one-fifth the cost. All right, but you're not going to spend the $86 million if you bonded it right away, no, you, you wouldn't. You wouldn't need that budget. And you couldn't. I mean, legally, you couldn't because you'd be earning so much interest on this stuff. We'd get in trouble. So, um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know when I leave, I'll have more questions. Thank yeah. you for yeah. the effort. Well, I think too, if you guys have questions, you should feel free to send those to Bud and or Dave. My name's Lee Burns on Liberty Street. 
I had a question about the location of one of the treatment facilities at the marina and wondering what impact do you think global warming and sea rises will have to that operation? Uh, the, the elevation of land there is, I want to say, 15 or so feet above sea level. We, we, would, um, we would expect that location to be okay. I think the properties that are in that area are going to be more susceptible. The, the properties that currently have septic systems that would go to that area are more susceptible to sea level rise than that location would be itself, the service area. As I said, we do have another meeting coming in, so we have time for one or two more questions if there are any. Raise your hand if you like the mic. Yes, sir. It's, it, it's a chicken or egg question, but I, if, if, the, if, t if you, there was approval to proceed today, uh, financial approval, you would need to go through a number of steps to get it permitted and then designed, bid, built, and operational. And typically that time frame is, for a small project, might be two and a half years. For a bigger project, it, might, it could be as long as five years. So it's, it's a, a, a planning level, I'd say three to five years. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else? All right, well, I want to thank you all for coming out. Again, it's, uh, it's good to see concerned citizens and um, members out here. I want to thank all of you for coming out, making the time to present to us tonight. Um, and again, I would encourage you, if you still have more questions, feel free to reach out to Town Hall, talk to Bud, talk to Dave, okay? Thanks again. Have a great night, you all.